We're continuing with the theme of forgiveness and grace through this Lenten season. We are off the lectionary now, and I'm going to read this morning from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Please open your imaginary bile green hymnal, the Pharisees we can sometimes be, to page 999 and sing with me. The words are on the screen. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror cause I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a heck of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. I hope you were singing at home. No one in the sanctuary was singing, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Now, isn't this the Pharisee's hymn, really his anthem? Both the song and his eloquent elocution masquerade as prayer. Both faint humility as well as a sense of striving for righteousness. It's hard, Lord, but I'm doing it. The trouble is, as soon as you start to brag about how humble you are, you prove precisely how humble you are not. And while the song was composed tongue-in-cheek, the Pharisee's prayer certainly was most sincere. We're used to Pharisees being the villains in their encounters with Jesus because they were always trying to trip him up in order to bring him down. And we're used to tax collectors, those who blatantly disregarded God's law, being used to shame those who are righteous under that same law. A few weeks ago, we read the story of Zacchaeus, who climbed up a tree to see Jesus, whom Jesus called by name, whose home Jesus visited, who sat at the table and ate with him. The crowd went wild because they condemned Jesus for the company he kept. And that wasn't the first time that Jesus cried out to a tax collector. There's Matthew, also known as Levi, one of the 12, hardly a humble fisherman, not like Peter or the sons of Zebedee. Jesus called a tax collector. He chose a tax collector, and again, he went to his home, and again, he sat at the table with him. There is no wonder that the Pharisees were scandalized by that because they were keepers of the law, strict adherence to God's word. So in their eyes, a tax collector would be a traitor because he colluded with Rome. He was an enemy of God's people. Tax collectors were known cheats. They handled unclean currency that bore both the image of the Caesar, the Roman Empire, and also the inscription, Divine Son of God. A commandment breaker there and a real deal breaker for the Pharisees. But you need to understand, the Pharisees weren't being villains for the sake of villainy. No more the tax collectors were known for their hearts of gold. The Pharisees were absolutely sincere in belief that obedience to the law was pleasing to God. Their hypocrisy, their real sin, was born of the false notion that ticking off all of those boxes, and you've got to remember there were 613 laws in the Torah that if you were able to fulfill all 613, you were superior to other people and then put in a position where you were able to and really appointed to judge other people. So what better moment for a strict adherent to this law to arrive at the temple than in the company of one who was condemned under the law? But while the Pharisee is glad to measure his righteousness against that of the tax collectors, he won't stand too close. We've heard a lot about social distancing, and this is exactly what we're talking about here. The Pharisee gives wide berth to this sinner because he wants to avoid contamination. God, he begins, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
not only is he good with all the don'ts that the law commands, he's doing right things at well. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. Now fasting is good. We advocate fasting, especially during Lent. And tithing is great because the Lord and every last pastor on the planet that I know loves a cheerful giver, right? Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. But if you go back to the beginning of the lesson, Jesus tells this story to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. If Jesus were here today, he might begin a parable, a Catholic priest, a United Methodist pastor, and a drug dealer walked into a soup kitchen. Now, if you're the clergy, the religious insider, you're certain the joke is going to skew your way. But then Jesus pulls the rug out from under you. You're not the hero. You're the butt of the joke. It's the dirty, rotten, law-breaking, no-good sinner who comes off smelling like a rose. Listen again to Jesus' words. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Imagine the horror of these self-righteous men when Jesus goes on to say that it is the tax collector and not the Pharisee who goes home justified from the temple, the place of sacrifice and atonement. It's the sinner who goes home justified. So we have to ask ourselves, is God commending the sins of the tax collector and disparaging those who keep the law, the very law that God has given? Of course not. But as I've shared many times, the law was given to help humankind live rightly before God and with one another. The law was given to instruct and encourage God's people, but it was never given as a weapon to use against anyone else. God never intended us to condemn each other under the law. But for the Pharisee, it had become all about what he was doing. As long as he was observing all those 613 commandments, he really didn't even need God anymore. And even if he failed at a few, as long as he was doing better than the other guy praying next to him in the temple, he was looking pretty good. For the tax collector, it was all about seeking mercy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus taught when he took them up the mountain. Those who know that God's grace is their only hope. That's what Paul was saying to the church in Rome in the passage that Bill read. Distinctions were being made between those who were coming to Christ as Jews and those who were coming from the Gentile world, the heathen world. The Gentile converts were being looked down upon, condemned. And so Paul warns the Jewish Christians that the judgment they give will be the judgment that they receive because they were putting limits on God's grace. Listen again to verses 4 and 5 from the second chapter of the letter to the Roman church. Do you despise the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Christians still struggle today with the desire to judge others. We compare ourselves with other sins who seem worse than our own. Westboro Baptist Church comes to mind, a congregation whose sole mission, it sometimes seems, is to pick at the funeral of fallen soldiers, Mr. Rogers, and even members of this congregation. Not only to pick at the funerals, but to proclaim these persons eternal damnation. The coronavirus and the cancellation of worship gatherings has created an opportunity for Christians to pass judgment on each other's faith or perceived lack thereof. Just this week, someone sent me a clip from a televised worship service in a megachurch, an independent congregation whose congregation is so large that they worship in an arena. The pastor was encouraging the worshipers there to reach out and to shake hands, to embrace one another in spite of the virus warnings. He laughed and said, this is a quote, the only time the church will close is during the rapture. The Bible school is open because we are raising up revivalists, not pansies. When I found myself saying out loud to the screen, I'd rather be a pansy than a dead nitwit, I thought about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Because like most of Jesus' parables, this one has that aha moment. As soon as we find ourselves judging the Pharisee, the Westboro Baptists, or the pastors who call us pansies, we become what Jesus is warning us against, the oldest sin in the book, trying to be like God. There's only one judge because only one who is without sin is able to judge. I am not without sin. So I am in no place to judge anyone else.
You familiar with the term grading on the curve? We've heard a lot lately about bell curves in terms of the coronavirus. Flattening the curve has been the goal of keeping our distance from each other, which could limit the mathematical probability for the number of people who will contract the virus. In education, the distribution of grades is expected to fall on a bell curve. Most students are expected to score somewhere in the middle, which is why the letter C is considered an average grade. A few students will be above, a few will be below, and even fewer at the very top or at the very bottom. If no one scores at or even near the top, a teacher might decide that a test was just too difficult, and then the teacher might grade on the curve. So if the top grade is a 75, that becomes the A. When I was in seminary, my church history professor was notoriously tough. There were over 80 people in the class, so she gave an objective exam with fill-in-the-blank questions, a matching section, multiple choice, and short essays. But the fill-in-the-blank and multiple choice answers were mostly dates and who said what. Now, you have to remember that church history is a class that covers 2,000 years of history. And the matching section was in Latin. And there were 40 short essays in a two-hour exam, 40 short essays. She expected each to fill up a page of a blue book. Very few students finished. I didn't finish. I didn't come close to finishing. And when I got my grade back, I received a 54 and was horrified to find out that was one of the highest grades in the class. Well, the next day, over 80 students stormed the dean's office with torches and pitchforks demanding justice. And the dean instructed the professor against her will to grade us on the curve. My 54 out of 100 became a B plus instead of a D. Even though I missed nearly half the questions, my D became a B plus when compared to the rest of the class. God does not grade on the curve. The final judgment is not going to be a lineup. It's not about how good we look compared to others. If I stand at the final judgment before God and Hitler and Mengele are on one side and maybe Stalin and Charles Manson on the other, well, I am going to look pretty good. I never murdered anyone. I was not a white supremacist. I did not d deny God's existence. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. But what if, and this is more likely the scenario, I end up between Billy Graham Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., or any of the mothers and fathers in the history of the Christian faith that I couldn't name on my exam. Who ends up smelling like a rose in that scenario? It will not be me. We're not called to compare ourselves favorably or unfavorably against others. The standard bearer for our life is Jesus Christ. Paul will go on to say in chapter 3 of his letter to the Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I read that on Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. None of us is in a position to say, thank you, Lord, that I am not like him or her or them, because each and every one of us is dependent on God's grace for our salvation. Not being together in worship has been very painful for us. Not being able to hold our Amish Grace book study or our film series has been disappointing. Tonight's canceled film, Dead Man Walking, speaks to this parable to our reluctance to forgive those whose sin we see as worse than our own or unforgivable. The film looks at a man on death row who's visited by a nun. There is nothing likable or seemingly redeemable in this man. He is a violent, hate-filled bigot. Next to him, the tax collector in our story looks like a hero. And yet, Sister Helen Prejean wills herself to visit him, wills herself to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with him, and finally wills herself to love him. And she, just like the Amish and the Nickel Mines community, who forgave the man who murdered their children, she, like them, is condemned for being able to forgive, for patterning her life on Christ instead of the Pharisee who could not see his own sin. Forgiveness is not easy. In so many ways, we'll never be able to forgive until we stop judging others, until we understand that we are both the Pharisee and the tax collector, the one who looks down on others' sins and the one who really messed up. The real question is, how will we respond 
Will we go to God on our righteousness or on our knees? During Lent, I've changed the wording in the bulletin. Instead of the call to worship, we've begun with an invitation to grace. This morning, we began with the opening verses of Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose sin is forgiven. But the psalmist goes on from there to confess his need to confess and his need for grace. While I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. When it comes to crimes, there are degrees. There are misdemeanors, there's felonies, felony one and a felony two. Sin isn't like that, although we'd like to think so. Because everything we do that displeases God, that disappoints God, whether it's violating the law itself or just by the way we treat others, every time we fall short is falling short of Jesus Christ. It's not about being better than other people. It's not about being worse than other people. It's about grace. And grace is what makes forgiveness possible. It is not that hard to be humble. If we remember like the tax collector to begin our prayers with, God have mercy on me, a sinner. If we confess how our own behavior cries out for a savior, then through the spirit's power, we can learn to look at others with the same mercy that has been shown to us. Then we can begin to forgive others and even to forgive ourselves. Then we will be the ones who go home justified not by our own merit, but by God's grace alone. Amen.